Hey, everybody. Hi. Y'all are so um, ready. Thank you for being so. Um, where I was getting my tea, so it took me a little bit of a little bit longer than I anticipated. How is everybody doing? And where are you tuning in from? And my favorite question, obviously, what kind of tea are you sipping on? Welcome, welcome. I see people trickling in. Hi. Hi, y'all. Hello, Fort Worth area. Love to see it. Hello, Dallas in the building. How are you? What kind of tea? LA, Canada. I see there's a slight delay. There's a little bit of lag. Um, New Jersey. Okay. I feel like we hit like four corners there. Chicago, Cave Page. I literally just flew in from Chicago today. Um, Jersey boy, I rep Brooklyn. <laughs> when I lived in, Brook in Brooklyn, I rep Brooklyn, but I was from Jersey. But Brooklyn just seemed like a little bit cooler to rep. Um, or the New York area. Um, tuning in from Maryland, Arizona, North Carolina. Um, right now I'm having cinnamon tea. Hi from Delaware. What are y'all all having? What kind of tea are you sipping on? I'm very curious. Um, I get some tea ideas from y'all. So in part, this is a selfish ask. It's a selfish question because I want to know what kind of new teas are there that I should probably be put on. Um, peach green tea. Yes, I've had that before. So good. Drinking some hot chai. Nice, Muffet. Um, love it, love it. That's a very, very big difference. Green tea, chai. Di very different vibe. Um, so, but both have like a little bit of caffeine in it. So I see y'all trying to stay up. I appreciate that. Um, okay, y'all. So we're going to talk about like one of my favorite topics to cover. And I'm so excited because also, like I, I just gave a speech um, at the Summit of Greatness, which is this wonderful conference that is uh, held by Lewis Howes and his team, who are part of the School of Greatness team. And when I tell you, it, it was an incredible, incredible experience. However, what I covered had to do with trauma storage in the body. And I was like, why am I not covering this on YouTube? This needs to be a part of our conversation here, too. So um, here we are. And I'm excited to, to get into um, just some good knowledge about uh, really kind of in Bessel van der Kolk's words, how the body keeps the score, right? So to get us started, I wanted to just dive into how trauma is stored in the body just globally. It's like just a general part of our conversation. Um, you're not hearing me? Oh, Kim. Ginger tea, I hear that. I could also speak a little louder. I'm very soft-spoken, so I get that a lot, that people can't hear me. So I'll be sure to speak up a bit because I'm pretty like zen, and, and sometimes I forget that um, I need to kind of, you know, project a little. So I'll be sure to do that. But um, trauma stored in the body, then I want to transition into a little bit of what basically we might call like body triggers and really what they are, what they look like, just so that you have that knowledge base as well. Um, so we're going to get into a bit of that. And then I want to leave a really good chunk of time for us to be able to dive into some like Q&A or for me to like, you know, maybe kind of connect with some of your comments, which I, I always want to make sure that we do and offers a little bit of space here for that. So trauma, some of you may already know, some of you may read like books that have to deal with somatic therapy or The Body Keeps the Score, which I think is probably the most popular book kind of in that area of like understanding the body as a storage place for trauma. And if you are, then I think you're pretty ahead of the curve when it comes to like this discussion. And I'm also going to, you know, try and kind of elevate the conversation a bit. So 
our trauma and the experience of emotional, emotionally based trauma has always been thought of as something that happened mostly in the mind and that we could just kind of work with the mind and then we're done with the trauma. But what we were seeing many decades ago and we continue to see now is that to be frank, a person can be living in a body that is on fire and is not even realizing it because what they're living in is in a body that is in trauma. So they could be like even going to therapy and doing a lot of the heady work around trauma. They could be journaling. They could be doing like all kinds of things that maybe talking to family members, being able to like speak out loud so that they can like hear their own story, just like regurgitated. Like all these things are part of things that people do in order to, you know, try and reconcile their trauma. And what a lot of people don't realize is that a heavy, heavy percentage of what trauma is, is a body centered experience. So because emotions are body centered process, most often than not, we need to understand it from the perspective of how do we then undo some of what's been stored in the body through body centered practices. So the, it's a body centered process that requires body centered practices. And so more often than not, people want to dive right into their story. Whenever it comes to trauma, or whenever it comes to anything that's happened to somebody, they want to go right into it, especially when they like, let's say, go and to see a therapist. Like They're like, okay, this is what happened. What happens after that is that they feel an emotional hangover all over their bodies. This may have happened to you and you may be familiar with this. People become super exhausted. They become a little bit dissociative, like disconnected from themselves and from others. They feel like they're like walking in a cloud and like they're just not present. Um, they feel like their body feels sore and tender. Sometimes people feel actual like symptoms that are body-based. Heart palpitations, that's a big one, right? Many many times people start feeling like their, their heart's going to explode and they're just sitting in place. There's nothing really happening, but they just feel like they literally like ran a mile. Other people have sweaty palms whenever they're experiencing trauma symptoms. Other people get headaches. Other people get tense muscles in the back of their necks that don't go away regardless of how many massages or whatever they get. Other people get really bad stomach aches. Some people get actual symptoms that look like IBS. Um, and other people get, you know, spasms. I mean, I, I can go on and on. There's a full list of different symptoms that look like some sort of body situation, like a physical illness or something that physically is happening to the body that is very much directly connected to the experiences of what happened to that person, to the emotion that is tied to those experiences and to the trauma responses that are surfacing. So in part, I wanted to take this moment to really get into that with y'all to really kind of unpack it, right? Because more often than not, when people are talking about trauma, they still default to what is happening in a person's mind that is then creating a circumstance or an emotion rather than what is happening in a person's body that is creating a circumstance or, emotion or an emotion. And I say that to say, I feel like that was a little heady, but I say that to say that it is incredibly important for us to be mindful of our bodies whenever we are feeling overwhelmed and like emotionally, like there's a lot happening in our lives. More often than not, when a person is feeling like their emotions are overtaking their body and it's feeling like maybe too much to handle at a certain point in time, what they're gonna do next is usually not gonna look very pretty. What they're gonna do next is gonna be reflective of how on fire their body is. And so typically the, the example that I like to use is like, if you imagine that there is a couple fighting, you're fighting with your significant other and you're about to say something really rude really like short and ill-spirited and you know it's going to cut them deep and you really try to stop yourself and you can't 
why is it that you can't stop yourself? It's because every single part of your body in that moment is invested in protecting you. And so you're thrusting out. Like you're not able to stop yourself in that moment because every part of you is working physically, working to get out those words to fend off the person that you believe is a threat in that moment that is triggering that trauma response. And so more often than not, I try to help people understand, like, listen, you you ha- you are a ball of cellular memory. Your entire body is remembering a lot of circumstances that have happened to you all day, every day. And so as a result, if you get triggered by, let's say, your significant other or maybe your, your boss or anybody in your life, what's going to happen is that all that cellular memory is going to get re-triggered. And then your body's going to say, I have to fight. I have to fend off this threat because it's it's probably going to make me like typically what we think is like something really bad is going to happen to us it's going to make me disappear i'm going to not, not be well like whatever whatever thoughts you know maybe going through our heads um but typically it's the thoughts that we're not going to survive the moment we're going to be overthrown by this person and as a result what we have to do is enter war and typically that's what we do we enter war because we don't feel like we are in a safe place. And if we don't, we don't feel bod- bodily safety or like our body is in a state of psychological safety, if it's settled and if our nervous system is settled, if we don't feel that, then what's going to happen is that our bodies are going to start being reactive and they're going to act on our behalf. And we're going to actually like do the things that we at some point wish we wouldn't have done in order to protect ourselves. That's so true. Yes. Listen to my body to realize the impact of my trauma. I think a lot of what we need to do generally in society is to listen to our bodies. I mean, let's take, for example, the fact that we just got through a pandemic. All of us just underwent a massively, massively critical crisis where our perception of safety had been compromised for an extended period of time. And for many of us, we actually experienced like so much. We experienced grief. We experienced people actually losing their lives. And we were all wondering, am I going to be next? When you talk about trauma, the most pervasive forms of trauma are the ones that threaten your actual safety. The types of trauma that make you feel like I may not survive this. This is why when we talk about childhood trauma, that tends to be one of the most pervasive types of traumas or the ones that people feel the deepest because you're this very, very fragile little person that is at the mercy of these big people, adults. And if they're physically abusing you or hurting you in some way, then you are feeling like, oh no, I could lose my life, right? So there's that perception of, actual threat and actual loss of life. And so when we're talking about, you know, now in our adult selves, now in relationships, and now what our bodies remember, our bodies remember that we could, by way of somebody like posing a threat, we could very well not survive. And so even if it's not apples to apples, it's not the same person. It's not the same language that they're using. They're not using the same um, bodily, like nonverbals, it's not the same kind of situation at all. It doesn't matter. Your body just registers. There's a threat. And because there is a threat, I must do everything in my power to fend off that threat. I must protect myself. I must survive. And so in that moment, whenever you're in that argument, you're not able to go into your logical mind and say, this person is not the person that I experienced 20 years ago when I was a child where I felt deeply scared. Your mind is not going to that place. What your mind is doing instead is that it's going directly into a war zone. It's going into fight mode. It's going to battle the person in front of you. And what you're going to want to do is human instinct, survive. It's a lot, right? Kind of reminds you of the fact that we're literal mammals. We're like animals, right? And so it's just a little bit of a remembrance of the fact that, yeah, we are these like 
really advanced mammals and we have capacities that no other animal has on this planet. Um, but that doesn't take away the fact that we still are a part of the planet and we're a part of the li living organisms within the planet. And that makes it so that we experience things inside of our bodies that are a part of survival. Wow, this makes so much sense. Yeah, June, it's, um, you know, I think if you go back to the basics of who we are, I think it would make sense for any of us to think, hey, listen, if I'd gone through something that's really tough, like trauma, it's very likely that the trauma isn't just something that's inside of my mind because the mind isn't even, um, we call it like organic, right? The brain is organic. It's tangible matter where you could like actually touch the brain inside if you like crack a skull, right? But the mind isn't. You can't see someone's mind or what they're thinking. So why would it be that emotional trauma and emotions as complex as they are would only be inside of a mind? It has to be more complex than that. This is so good. Keep up. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so that was a large part of what I wanted to emphasize to start us off with. That's a big start, y'all. <laughs> but um, but I think it's an important piece of what we need to hold in consideration in reference to the ways that our bodies remember the experiences of our lives. Because we could very well be in a circumstance where we are in ongoing battle and don't know really how to get ourselves out of it. And what I oftentimes tell people is that if you want to get yourself out of the trauma response, we need to stop looking just at the words that are being said, the thoughts that are being thought, and the emotions that are being experienced. We need to think about how the three of those things connect back to the body. Back in when I started you know, just learning a, a little bit of like the, the foundational stuff around psychology. I remember we were doing what we call theories classes, right? So you just learn about the theories and the approaches and like who the scientists were that created the theory and blah, blah, blah. And many of you may have heard of like cognitive behavioral the theory. Cognitive behavioral theory is what it says. It's about cognition, basically like the thoughts that are being thought or expressed by the person. And it's about behavior. So it's what those thoughts lead a person to do. Cognitive behavioral, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy also had this thing called the cognitive triad. And the cognitive triad was the cognitive piece, thoughts, the behavior, and also the emotion. So what was thought around that, the, the, the theory basically would say, a person has thoughts that influence emotion, that influence behavior. So what they're thinking, oh, that person is a threat. That person, they, they want me to feel terrible. That's the thought. The emotion is, I'm afraid of feeling that way. The behavior is, I'm going to fight them tooth and nail so that they don't make me feel that way. So it's the cognitive triad. So it's a little bit kind of related, right? Um, but it, I, I like to then add the the added element that we now, after those moments, because that was like more so in the 50s that we were like really getting to know that philosophy around the mind. And then came like the 80s and 90s and we started learning more about, oh, wait, we forgot a whole entire dimension of how people experience their emotions. There's a body too. And so now we have the body. Somebody probably needs to do like a square at this point. But now we have the body that's very much a part of that dynamic. You have thoughts that convert into emotions and those emotions are deeply felt in the body. And then what we do is the result of how we feel in our bodies. So we have thoughts, we have emotions, we have the body sensations, and then we have behaviors. I'm going to take a sip of tea because I've been talking a lot. Um, but that is like a lot of how we now are starting to see how people experience emotions. How is that resonating with folks? Because I, I, as y'all know, I get really heady and like a little bit nerdy. So I just want to make sure that it's resonating and that you feel um, like it feels like it's connecting the dots a little bit, even if you have been 
maybe oriented around like somatic psychotherapy, which is like the type of psychotherapy that includes the body as a key part of our emotions and also includes body-based practices. Or if you have been familiar with like Bessel van der Kolk's work, which I think very beautifully, you know, kind of highlights this, this um, type of theory. Um, okay, you should trademark the cognitive square. I should do that. I should do that. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah. Um, but not actually very true. So I might. Um, but yeah, I think um, it's it's key for us to, to really have visual. So I love how the cognitive triad offers that visual because it's a triangle and the triangle is supposed to kind of go in either direction. So each one can influence the other. And I guess if there was a square, each one can influence the other, right? Um, because the body sensations that we feel that are now what came from the emotion now start to drive emotion. Let me explain that further. So you're feeling fearful. That fear creates an alarmed state in your body. Your body is, like I say, I call it on fire, right? Your body's on fire. It feels like um, you're having like all kinds of things, headaches, sweaty palms, all the things. Because you're experiencing a lot of that, what that's doing is that it's now feeding another emotional state. Let's call it sadness. Maybe there's sadness or, or shame around the fact that you can't stop yourself from feeling that way. A lot of people, especially trauma survivors, experience a lot of shame. So they're shame. And now the shame is feeding the, let's say that you're acting, you're, you're basically, because you feel ashamed, you're yelling and you're trying to like fend off, you know, the threat that you believe is there. Now you're feeling guilty because you feel like you've said something that's made the other person feel bad. That guilt is being re-experienced in your body. And then you go back to fear and then you go back to shame and then you go back to guilt and become so circular. And that's a part of why people find themselves not being able to really get out of these patterns because it becomes like, so they don't know like where it stops and where it ends and where to cut through the, the square or the circle or the <laughs> whatever diagram. They just don't know where to cut through to be able to have some breathing space. So of course, if you're a clinician that has been trauma trained specifically from a somatic lens, then what you're going to do is that you're going to say, I know where to cut through. I can help you with that. And it starts with settling your body. It's not with the mind. The mind isn't going to settle unless we have a settled body. So when, where we need to cut through is wherever that cycle is hitting the body. So wherever the body is experiencing the overwhelm of shame, that's where we're going. Does that make sense, y'all? <laughs> these these emojis it's so funny um so i think who was it that said that they listened to their body pull so Paul mentioned that they listen to their body more and more and that body attunement is a part of especially that primary part of how we start getting into body based practices body attunement is so important it is so critical really to just have as humans. I love to do body attunement, even though now I don't practice, uh, I don't do therapy at all, but now um, in like my latter years of like doing therapy, I wasn't practicing with children. However, doing actual body-based attunement with little ones can be so liberating for them before they even get to a place where their bodies are on fire. Um, if any of you are parents or if you're like, you know, if you have little ones in your lives that you care deeply for, I think that this is a message that I think may resonate with any of you, right? Like to really carve out some space into their lives to help them to learn what their bodies feel like. And that way they don't have to be the adults like us that then have to, you know, learn through these books or, you know, other resources 
that they need to get back into their bodies. And then it's so incredibly hard to do because you have to actually do the body-based work a bunch of times before you even feel settled. For kids, you can actually teach them and say, hey, let's take five minutes and let's do a body scan. Be mindful, right? Like of the kid's history. But um, but especially like if it's your kid and you want to make them body conscious, like that's something that can be done, right? Um, all it is is really scanning the body. Like you close your eyes and you scan the body. There's a lot of body scans like on YouTube and in other resources that I think can be helpful too. Some that may even be like age appropriate for kids that can help a child to actually enter a, a mind state where they're mindfully attending to every part of their body. And they might be able to, you know, say like, oh, I realize I have like a tingling sensation on my right foot, right? That's something that they may not have noticed before. And although it's probably something super benign and has nothing to do with trauma. What I'm getting at here is that we can teach kids to get ahead of the curve and understand their bodies a lot better than what we have. And whenever something comes up where they really do feel like they're in an alarm state, they're able to notice how their body is experiencing that alarm state. And they don't have to like wonder like, why am I in this cycle? Yeah. Any specific? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you about my three. These are my go-tos. Uh, if, if you like follow my work really closely, there's a chance that you may have already like heard one or two of these, but these are my go-to body-based practices that I like to present to people because they're accessible. You can do them anywhere and because they work. So the, the actual practices that I always like to do for myself and for others and with others are, of course, breathing. Breathing is an actual body-based practice. A lot of the popularization around breathing as an actual practice for us to do in order to induce a relaxation effect in our bodies is really real. Like we can actually engage the nervous system in a, in a what do we call it? in a way where you can actually feel more at ease and relaxed. Let's call it that. Because I didn't want to get too heady and go into like the different branches of the nervous system and what happens within them. I think I can maybe cover that at, at a later time. But it does create a relaxation process. So I don't like discounting breathing, even though I think, you know, we, we talk about it probably so much that some people are probably like, really breathing, but really breathing. Like, and breathing really does help. And it it, it can actually be helpful for both children and adults. The other practice that I like to do on a continuous basis is to rock. I actually have, I put a hammock in my backyard tree so that I could rock as much as possible whenever I get a chance to. But when I don't have access to my hammock, what I do is that I just rock my body. And that rhythmic sensation also allows the nervous system to start entering a relaxed state. So you can rock your body. You can breathe as you rock. You can also hum. Humming, it activates the same part of the nervous system that actually gets you to start feeling more relaxed and more expediently. When I did a speech at the Summit of Greatness, I had people do some of these practices and there were thousands of folks, it was beautiful, thousands of people all together doing these practices all together. Do you know how powerful that is when you can actually like heal next to someone and next to another person and with someone in front of you that's also healing and someone behind you that's also healing and you're all engaging in this collective healing, it's beautiful. So it is something that you can do with like, if possible, a sibling, a friend, like somebody that you feel like is a person that feel safe, or you can do it with your kid. It, it doesn't matter, like anybody that can feel like safe enough um, can be a really good buddy for doing these practices. And I think it really enhances the effect. So does humming to music work? Varun, that's a great question. So yes, absolutely. Actually with the people that I used to work with one-on-one, -on -one, my recommendation was always to take one song that they listen to throughout the day, 
we most of us are listening to something, right? Take one of those songs and hum the entire song. And that would be the humming practice that would already be baked into their day so that they wouldn't have to do the thing that we always do, right? Which is, a, oh goodness, I have to do that thing so that my nervous system can be more regulated so that I can actually like break these cycles. Instead of feeling like you have to carve time into your day, looking at whatever is already in your day, like a playlist that you really love and actually humming either the tune or the words of the song so that you can actually like take a song is in approximate four minutes or so, four entire minutes of, of your time to actually hum. And so that's a, a really great question. And it is very much what I tend to recommend to folks so that you know the, the practice can be carved into their day. The same with rocking. I have been in like actual corporate meetings and I'm like, I'm like this and I'm rocking and I'm like, I'm going to be talking to you all while I'm rocking. And that is what it is, right? But I'm regulating, I'm regulated, right? I'm settled. And that matters to me. And if it matters to you, you may like carve it into random moments in your day too. But that rocking, that rhythmic experience that you're giving your body is allowing your body to feel soothed and at ease. And you got to think about all the things that worked when we were babies. What worked for us? It, it helped us to feel somebody rocking us, right? That put us to sleep. When somebody hummed a lullaby to us, that put us to sleep. So a lot of what we're going back to is the basics. It's the things that us as, let's go back to mammals, us as animals can, if the things that actually help us to feel a great amount of ease because it's already baked into the fabric of who we are. So a lot of these somatic psychotherapies are really just taking the information from what works for us to help us feel at ease, how our nervous system functions, how rhythm works to help us feel more soothed. And we're taking all of that information and we're bringing it back into the therapeutic room in order to give people the practices that we know are going to be really helpful to them. So love these tips. Thanks, Mafid. Yeah. Um, so I present those tips because I really want y'all to remember them. When the time comes tomorrow, for you to think about how am I going to make this day different? I like to even ask myself this question on a daily basis. What would my highest self do today in order to take care of herself? And so if you ask yourself that question at the very top of your day, it allows you an opportunity to think about the three things that I mentioned and identify which one you want to do because your higher self would probably choose to do a relaxation practice that can help ease the mind and ease the body. So if you're anything like me, then, you know, you probably would like go directly into, you know, doing some humming right away or, you know, doing some, some breath work as I'm making my cup of tea and my cup of coffee in the morning, I go into practice, right? I do whatever it is that I need to do in order to settle my body. And then whatever comes thereafter is already coming from a pers from the perspective of me being in a more settled body. And it already is me breaking the cycle of what could happen in my day that could keep the cycle going. So I could be in that square, right? Or I could do the practices in the very top of my day to try and break cycles so that the rest of my day can be reflective of my highest self and the fact that I've broken those cycles. Humming to Bad Bunny. Yes. I mean, I'm so here for it. I am one of those people that's like listen, listening to that um, Un Verano Sin Ti album like <laughs> all the time. So you better believe I've been humming to some Bad Bunny. So that is very welcome, y'all. Whatever it is that you want to hum to, it could be some Whitney Houston and like hit some high notes, or it could be like some, some Bad Bunny and hit those low notes. It's all welcome. However, I will say, I know that we're like joking about the Bad Bunny thing, but Bad Bunny has like this really deep singing voice. And what, what is like, I think really good about those kinds of songs with anybody's voice that is really deep is that 
the deeper the tone of your hum, the deeper you go into the nervous system regulatory process. So there is like this nerve, this cranial nerve that goes like from your brain down your spine. It's called the ventral vagal nerve. And that nerve is basically the nerve that we are triggering to say like, hey, we need you, relax. And so when we're humming, we're triggering that nerve. And the deeper your hum, the bad bunny deep, right? Like the deeper your hum, the deeper that you're going to be able to actually connect with that nerve. So bad bunny may not be such a bad idea. I'd love to hear it. Maybe the next uh, hot tea video I'll do would be like a bad bunny uh, humming. <laughs> um. <laughs> I love it. I love it. These are these are great suggestions. Any thoughts or questions that anybody might have in, in the moments that we have left? I want to make sure to honor anything that may be on your mind. I would love to implement breathing, rocking, and humming into my preschool classroom. I love that. We have a time in our schedule called Mindfulness and Music. That's beautiful, Jocelyn. I actually used to be like a psychologist that would go into... Um, a bunch of pre-KK first and second grade classrooms, and I would help the teachers to implement mindfulness practices for the little ones, and then and we would practice it with the little ones. So and they loved it. So I would go ahead and and do something like that. The kitties love this type of stuff, and they sponge it up, and it's an 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 important opportunity for an educator to really make a, a meaningful difference in a kid's life that's beyond the heady difference, you know, like just imparting knowledge. You're like really imparting healing and that's really beautiful. So I'm all about that. I love that. I will try it in my high school. Yes. Yes. That's beautiful. Yeah. You know, y'all, I started off when I started doing workshops I started off actually doing workshops with teachers and it's, that's been so many years. I, I, that was like 2015. It's been so many years that I actually forgot that a lot of what I talk about on here can also be implemented in the classroom. And I forget that it's not just parents, but it's also teachers because um, teachers have kids for so much longer than parents do throughout the day. And you have such a great influence and it, it is, you know, it's very powerful when you utilize that influence to actually make a difference in a child's life in this way. So I love that you're already doing that. That's, and that you're also like feeling motivated to do that. That's really beautiful. Love that. Oh, I feel so invigorated by this. This is beautiful. Anything else? We already meditate. I can't imagine what my life would have been like if I had teachers that meditated with me. I mean, I'm grateful that I came upon meditation even in my early 20s. And so it was early enough, but, and now I'm like almost 40. So it's been a very long time of me um, being in practice, but I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I used to, my nephew's 15 now, but I used, I used to do mindfulness and meditation with him all the time. And, you know, he's like a really emotionally intelligent kid. And I think a lot of that is in part to just how much he is able to sit with emotions and thoughts in a way that I wasn't trained to do, right? This is how we break cycles, right? We, we teach the next generation or a part of how we break them. We teach the next generation to be ahead of the curve and not have to um, fight their own minds and bodies, but to befriend them and um, and, it, and we do that in the classroom as well. So uh, I love it. I love it. I love this so much. It's making me so happy. Thank you for the teachers, just for who you are, for your service, and for being so willing to bring this into the classroom. That's so beautiful. Very lucky kids. Very, very lucky kids to have you. Um, any other thoughts or questions before we end? We have like two minutes. I want to make sure. If there's anything else I haven't covered. So we covered uh, just globally ways that trauma gets transmitted onto the body. I will be covering trauma in the body in different videos that I'm going to be putting out here on YouTube throughout the week. So definitely subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. 
And that way you can actually be privy to the more extensive um, conversation that I'm going to be having through these videos about the body, trauma in the body, and different practices that we can actually engage in to actually release trauma from the body on a daily basis. So um, I'll be putting those out for all of you. So just be sure to subscribe and then you get pinged whenever they drop. Um, I've been under training under the process work framework and I love seeing the similarities with body work. Yes, love that. It's very nice seeing that. Yes, I, anything that has body in it, I'm all for it. I operate from a holistic methodology, which means that I integrate somatic practices and body work. And I really couldn't see my work being anything other than. Um, but thank you so, so much for being here. Um, I will see you in the next tea therapy session where um, I'm going to be covering a whole new topic. But if you subscribe to this channel, you'll get notified whenever we are going live. And then also uh, of all the videos that I'm going to be putting out mostly on YouTube that are going to be around body and trauma. So yeah. Thank you so much for tuning in, y'all. It's been wonderful having y'all. Take care. Thank you.